Good evening, everybody. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, this Euretina educational webinar. I'm Elisabetta Pilato of the University of Padova in Italy. In the this evening, we will discuss about the latest developments in retinal vascular disease. I'm joined with uh, an international panel of speakers. So let's uh, I will introduce Michael Fox, the Queen's Wings Hospital Sorbonne University of Paris in France, Professor Dina Zur from the uh, Ophthalmology Division of Tel Aviv Medical Center, and uh, Professor Lisa Toto of the University of Vannunzio, uh, uh, PhD Scara, and PhD in Italy. Unfortunately, due to an expected event, uh, Professor Reina Slingman will not be able to attend this meeting, so the uh, program of this uh, event uh, has been changed just a little. So let's start with the first speaker, Professor Mike, uh, Michel Fox, please. He will talk about macular telangiectasis. Please, Mike. Uh, Thank you for the kind invitation, Elisabetta, and uh, hi, everyone. So I'll talk about some of the disease that we can talk, set, tell, describe as macular telangiectasis, which is a generic term for abnormalities in, in capillaries of the retina. Some entities are more clearly defined than others. MACTEL disease one and two are more clearly defined than PVAX or, or, or TELCATS. So, so I'll give an overview of what the current knowledge about these diseases. So I have no commercial interest relative to this presentation. So uh, MACTEL type one is a disease that is characterized by the presence of vascular bulges in the temporal uh, side of the fovea, usually in the temporal side of the fovea. And uh, it's uh, more frequent in males and it's a unilateral. So it resembles more or less the, the cold disease uh, subject that will be treated in another, another talk. So it's uh, something that could be assumed to be a local uh, small cold disease, let's say like that, even if some type one might tell you also have some abnormalities in the temporal periphery. So um, uh, treatment is once diagnosed by usual means and uh, fluorescein angiography, LCT, because there is local edema. So the, the treatment is not specific to uh, the type one MACTEL. There's nothing specific is treating the, uh, the edema. So usually it starts with uh, anti-VEGF or steroids. Uh, and then even can be followed by uh, or accompanied by a targeted laser to destroy the vascular abnormalities. So that, that's uh, something, it's a rare disease and uh, it's usually uh, controllable by the, the, the mean that we, we have. Um, type 2 MACTEL on the opposite is create, causes much more uh, difficulties in management. In fact, there is no commercially available treatment for type 2 MACTEL uh, and may cause a profound visual loss. So MACTEL type 2 is a progressive late onset retinal degenerative disease linked and that's a recent finding from the MACTEL program uh, that been conducted in the last year. It's, a, it's, a, it's associated to general metabolic disorder even if it manifests only in the macula. The, the gene have not been yet identified well to, at least to my knowledge. So it, it, it causes, again, uh, macular uh, damage located mostly in the temporal part of the, uh, of the retina. So it's uh, located, in fact, the same place as the type 1 MACTEL, but two disease have nothing to do. And it, it, on the left image, the color from this image, you see that there is early stage. You can see disturbance of the distribution of macular pigment. And uh, it, in later stage, it can give rise to atrophy of the uh, outer layer of the intermediate layer, new vessels. It's typically characterized by the presence also of dilated veins on the temporal side of, of the macula, as you see here, this vein. And th in this case, there is a pigment deposition making me suspect that there is a, a common complication of, of type 2 MACTEL, which is subretinal new vessels. And on OCT, it gives this characteristic aspect with atrophy of the outer layers, loss of the outer segments, and disturbance of the arrangement of the um, intermediary layer. So it's it's a disease of the whole retina, in fact. It's been attributed to the loss of neural cells, and so it affects um, uh, from the inner to the outer retinal layer. 
and um, it uh, may uh, cause profound visual loss and maybe bilateral as well. It's, it's, it's controlled only if there is uh, new vessels that can be controlled by anti-VEGF, otherwise there is no, no, no commercially available treatment, as I said. So there have been a lot of studies uh, dedicated, a lot of research dedicated to this disease. And uh, one of the diseases, one of the research addressed to the uh, phenotype of early stages of lacto type 2 and using a technique called FLEO, it's fluorescence lifetime imaging of thermoscopy. It's um, detecting how long the fluorescence stays after stimulation. It's measured in nanoseconds. And uh, it's quite spectacular to see the, the, that this technique technology uh, can be uh, very efficient to detect early stages of MACTEL, and uh, this is an illustration here being published in a, in a recent paper. So it may offer promises to better understand the, the chains of events that leads to the visual loss of these patients. Uh, OCTA also gives uh, uh, information about the uh, vasculature, and it gives this typical image of, it seems like there is a, some kind of a retraction, let's say, uh, agglomeration of, of vessels uh, on the temporal side of the fovea again. That's, this is rather typical of this type of two uh, maxil, and, and it's, uh, that's why I've been initially diagnosed with, before the OCT era as macular telangiectasis because there is a vascular abnormalities are prominent in that disease. Uh, so about the evolution of, of MACTEL type 2, it's, it's usually a slowly evolving disease. So the studies, long-term studies have shown that there is an average loss of one letter per year. Uh, however, that's in the absence of acute complication, it can be subretinal new vessels, and then of course, the, it's a completely different pathway that may be followed by, by the visual loss. Oh, uh, I thank the Lariboisier Hospital Department and uh, the ophthalmology department of the Hospital Lariboisier who sent me most of these, these slides on MACTEL type 2. So, uh, recently a major breakthrough in the origin of the disease has been found that it seems that there is a metabolic disease affecting serine metabolism that's uh, leading to abnormalities in lipid metabolism. Uh, and that lipids are toxic for several uh, cells in the retina. So the surprising thing that we end up with a metabolic disease affecting the oral organism, and it's only in the eye that you see clinical manifestation. Although there is a disease, a mutation that affects both the brain and the eye and gives MACTEL type 2, but in the vast majority of patients, the, the brain is totally normal and there is no recommended exploration of the brain to be done in these patients as well. Uh, there has been a trial on neurotrophic factors at CNTF uh, given by slow release uh, implants. And it's shown that uh, being, it could stabilize the disease to some point, at least on a structural uh, aspect. But given the very slow evolution of the disease, it's very difficult to, to evidence uh, loss of preservation of vision in this patient. However, it's promising that uh, a neurotrophic factor may give some hope to at least stabilize the disease. And, um, um, maybe future research will help to identify which patients are most likely to benefit from this uh, therapy. Okay, so another type of uh, telangiectasis of the retina is called telcaps and have been involved quite a lot in the identification of this entity, even if I'm not really not the first to identify that. Uh, so uh, telcasts are lesions that are deeply buried into macular edema and sometimes it's very difficult in the very complex fundus like this one it's the diabetic maculopathy which uh, hard exudates and you have to, to to detect the by, by and you can detect by icg and geography the or probable origin of, of the leakage it's uh, these um, dilated capillaries that some call capillary macronism and um, this, this, these lesions are very, uh, have a lot high affinity for ICG, but not for fluorescine. That's why probably been, uh, this can be underdiagnosed because routine angiograph ICG is not done in patients with diabetic retinopathy, of course. So here you see an example. You see some, uh, some reddish lesion surrounded by uh, a, a white uh, halo. And this is a corresponding image in this ICG. And this is the OCT. And this, uh, you may miss it on OCT even despite this large size, because if you don't do scans close enough, you may not be able to detect them. 
And so um, it's, um, it's in fact quite common, and uh, it's, it's, we have to dis distinguish them from large micro aneurysm. And one of the ways to distinguish them is the thickness of the wall, which is thicker in telcap than in micro aneurysm. Here is an illustration by uh, histology. You, you, this is uh, the, the telcaps, and you see the lumen is only restricted to this small area here, so there's a huge wall filling most of the lesion. That may lead, in fact, to spontaneous occlusion of these lesions. So um, when you uh, when you do, don't do ICG, you may miss these uh, these uh, lesions. If you look at the fundus, uh, it may appear under the aspect of a reddish, deeply buried lesion. And fluorescein is all negative, or it does not specifically highlight the lesion. And it's really ICG that brought us to get more interest in, in that lesion, since we could clearly identify uh, the, the 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 tail caps. And uh, OCTA is not. Uh, not very helpful. This is the OCT, structural OCT, which showed the thickened wall. And inside, that's also a specific feature of tail caps. You have association of these grayish deposits and also these dark deposits. And we believe that what is grayish is the circulation itself. And what is dark is what is intra, its intraluminal deposits. And we suspect that that is what captures ICG and leads to the long-term staining. This is an, uh, an ICG, again, showing a nice uh, uptake of ICG by the telcaps, and this is superimposed the OCTA, showing that really the OCTA in some cases are completely negative. We don't see anything, it's no signal, so it's uh, maybe, in fact, by contrast, an indication that there is a telcap there. Uh, it may, these telcaps may present different aspects, solitary here, such as a case of RVO, or maybe uh, multiple ICG uptaking lesions uh, that we call aggregates, typical of, of diabetics uh, patients. And the, the, uh, the um, ICE, uh, angiographic features are important also to make the diagnosis. This it's, is an ICG angiography. Here, microaneurysm, and this is a macroaneurysm, the tail caps. And you see, we faintly begin, see the largest one on the early frames. But on the late frame, it's the opposite. We see better than the micro that. So they fade away earlier than macro, than tail caps. It stays longer stained. And uh, mapping also may be useful to detect where they are. In fact, it gives us, it challenges the definition of focal versus diffuse edema, because uh, often after intravitreal injection, the edema fades away. But there are some islands, uh, islands of edema. And often, you find the tail caps in the middle of this island, such as this case here. It's, oh, and there it is. So, uh, of course, when you find one, especially a big one, why not try laser? Because we're, under, we're doing a trial currently in France about uh, randomizing intravitreal injection alone or intravitreal injection plus laser. And so it, uh, it's, um, uh, we, have, we hope to have the result next year. And even at worst, doing ICG, we believe in, in long term, IC, uh, even if in chronic edema, because often you may find these, and even in long term edema, you may recover some vision if you if you if you target these uh, lesions by laser. So uh, a competing concept has been emerging in the last year it is PVAC, peripheral exudative vascular animalous complexes. Um, it's is uh, being described more or less at the same time as we described tail caps around uh, two, 2000, 2012, 2010, 2011, and it's the work of Giuseppe Quercus who worked a lot on that. So, as opposed to tail caps, it occurs in a context where there is no general disease, well, no local disease, no vein occlusion, no uh, no diabetes, well, no diabetic retinopathy. And uh, this is an illustration here. You, you have exudations, and in the middle, you have a whitish uh, spot, uh, a reddish spot that faintly takes uh, for a scene and this showing an aspect similar to tail cap, although the wall may be thinner than what we see in tail cap usually. Uh, there is no documentation to my knowledge of ICG and PVAX, but maybe there is a paper showing that it does so. It would be interesting to see if it has the same feature of ICG geography. And it does in, in tail caps. So uh, this uh, has been recently diagnosed. So many disease can mimic uh, PVAX, and now our when it, it's, I think it's uh, it may be part of several other diseases. Type one MacTel, for instance, maybe at the frontier, maybe 
type one mag cell can be considered having PVAX, but focal, uh, localized in, in the temporal part of the macula. Uh, again, as same for tail caps, anti VEGF may work, as an illustration, or may not work. So sometimes you have to do laser. This is OCT and geography. Compared to my experience in tail caps, PVAX seem to be more often revealed by a PVAC, and that may be a distinguishing feature. We need to work on that a little bit more. Uh, so to, this is my last slide. So the PVAC are unilateral isolated peripheral microaneurysm. It's an elimination diagnosis. You have to eliminate systemic causes or local causes and the treatment as for telecaps, as for type 1 MAC tel is laser if extrafoveal anti vgf are possible. I'll also add that laser if possible, if, if extrafoveal, but also if there is no evidence whatsoever of any drusen, because if you do laser, focal laser, on a patient having drusen, then you may precipitate the uh, onset of, 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 of late uh, forms of AM, AMD. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Pafes. Thank you, Michel. Uh, there is a question from the, the panel. The, the question is, uh, uh, why TELCAP are better identified by ICG and geography? So that's an excellent question. I think it's because ICG is amphiphilic and fluorescein is hydrophilic, as you know. So, and the, the deposits have been also found by other authors by histology. The deposits are made up of proteins and lipids. And lipids are, of course, hydrophobic. So that's why I think uh, that uh, ICG is much more prone to detect these lesions. It, 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 it sticks to anything that in the lumen that is lipidic, and that's maybe the reason why. And um, why do you think that OCT and geography is negative uh, in, uh, um, is positive in, uh, um, in PEVAC and negative in TELCAPS? Another very good question. So, uh, have you, you seen the histology I showed? And the lumen is very small. And in fact, I think TELCAPS is not a dilation of the capillary, or may at the beginning be a dilation of capillaries, but also, the wall increases, and I think the wall even crushes the lumen at the end. So you end up with a small lumen and a very slow flow because you're in the context of vascular disease. That's why I think OCTA, which only detect motion, can be negative or only show the channel of perfusion, but not the whole lesion itself. And PVAC may be less, less severe tail caps. Let's say that's maybe the reason. So there's still dilation of the capillary, so uh, detectable by, by OCTA. Thank you. Thank you, Michel. You're welcome. So, um, so we, the next talk is about the Coates disease. And uh, uh, let's start since the very beginning, this history of the Coates disease. At the beginning was described by George Coates and uh, um, as a vascular telangiectasia, um, retinal vascular disease with exudation. And some year later, uh, Theodore Leber described uh, um, uh, some uh, miliary aneurysm. Um, they were called the Leber miliary aneurysm. And later, uh, Ries decided that uh, uh, these uh, were different manifestations of the same Coates disease. And so um, now we use the term of the Coates disease uh, to describe this specific retinal vascular disease. It's a rare disease, non-hereditary, characterized by the presence of retinal telangiectasia, idiopathic, with progressive retina exudation. We don't usually have a retina of vitreal attraction, which allow us to better distinguish this uh, Coates disease from other um, vitreal retina exudative uh, vascular diseases. And sometimes they can progress towards a retinal detachment and uh, towards the late stage of the disease, which is a neovascular glaucoma. The shields classified the cause uh, disease some years ago, and they this, this, uh, distinguished the stage one with retinal teleangiectasia only, and the stage two, which is characterized by the appearance of some uh, retinal uh, exudation, fovea or extrafovea. 
the stage three is characterized by the presence of uh, um, exudative retina detachment and stage four with the total retina detachment with the glaucoma and the late stage with advanced and stage disease, um, which can be found in some children. Usually it affects uh, many young female uh, males um, with uh, some uh, changes that we can appreciate uh, in the peripheral retina, mainly in the temporal side. However, uh, especially using uh, wide field fluorescein angiography, we can appreciate uh, that other uh, retina quadrants uh, may be involved by these uh, uh, retinal changes. And uh, it's considered mainly unilateral, but still again, with the uh, wide field retina imaging, now we can appreciate some uh, even mild changes in the periphery of uh, uh, retinal vessels, uh, like in this uh, young uh, boy. And uh, uh, the typical features of the Coates disease are the presence of telangiectasia, which are dilated, regular caliber, small, medium vessels in the periphery, typically, with some uh, typical light bull type uh, aneurysmal dilation, mainly of the arterial vessels. Uh, but, however, mainly if we perform a fluorescein angiography, we can appreciate the presence of the even small microaneurysms diffused all around. With fluorescein angiography, we can also better detect the presence of leakage from the aneurysmal lesions and from the telangiectasia and the microaneurysm. And moreover, thanks to the fluorescein angiography, we can appreciate, like in this case, the presence of these fine telangiectasia, which are um, um, not visible using uh, the fond examination at the biomicroscopy. The second more important uh, retinal feature is the presence of retinal exudation, which is uh, intra and the subretinal exudation, which usually affect uh, the posterior pole and it develop, uh, determine the development of fibrosis in the macular area in the foveal um, and in the fovea. And this great retinal exudation is responsible of the typical appearance of the sometimes the first manifestation of the Coates disease, especially in children with the leukocoria. Uh, in the late stage of the disease, we can appreciate macular fibrosis and uh, choroidal neovascularization, which is uh, the, these uh, um, two uh, um, macular complications um, determine the decrease in the visual acuity, mainly in the, in the boys. We now we um, the usually um, distinguish two different forms of Coates disease. One is called the child onset, and the other one is the adult onset Coates disease, with different mean age at the, um, of the disease onset and uh, also of the presenting symptoms. Because usually in children we may have strabismus and leukocoria. And uh, due to the late stage of the disease, due to the exudation of the posterior poles. Moreover, at the time of presentation, the stage of the disease is usually more advanced in child, children compared to adults, and definitely more aggressive in children compared to adults. From histopathological point of view, there are some histological, histopathological studies that demonstrated the presence of thickening and yellowization blood vessels and some changes in the endothelial cells, which are thinning and loss uh, with impairment of the blood retina barrier. Typical presence uh, um, where we have telangiectasias. Uh, however, what is amazing is that uh, thanks to these histopathological studies, uh, um, a widespread abnormalities have been demonstrated. This finding may be um, justified the presence and the progression of the disease, especially in adults, where we uh, observe the appearance of uh, anodismatic lesions all around, uh, even uh, in uh, uh, area previously spared. So, which kind of treatment? 
Laser photocoagulation definitely is the uh, first line of treatment. Uh, and many described reported uh, uh, cases have been treated with cryotherapy, most mainly in the past. Nowadays, uh, the, the first line treatment is the combination of treatment using intravitreal anti PHEF or intravitreal steroid combined to, um, to the laser treatment. Why anti PHEF? GF and in intravitreal steroid, it has been demonstrated that we there is an increase um, in of the intraocular cytokines, cytokines mainly vascular endothelial growth factor in children. Otherwise, mainly inflammatory cytokines in adults, and the, the levels of these uh, um, intraocular cytokines are related to the stage of the disease. So, in conclusion, in the coast disease, uh, it's very important to um, recognize early, especially in children, uh, the presence of this uh, retinal vascular disease because uh, it may uh, develop the term of the, an important decrease in visual acuity. With the advent of wide field retinal imaging, now we know that we have, um, we may have. Uh, a widespread uh, lesion all around, uh, and so especially also in the unaffected eye. And definitely they combine treatment using laser and uh, um, in, uh, combined with intravitreal anti PHEF and or steroids can better control the exudation of the disease. Thank you for your attention. So, any questions? Um, Michelle, may I ask you? Because we, dis we discuss about uh, the cause of disease uh, and the uh, retinal telangiectasia. And, uh, Michelle, uh, can we consider the um, Mactel that one a sort of mild form of codes because uh, I think that sometimes uh, there is uh, some uh, confusion in the dis uh, description of these uh, different condition. Oh, there is a question from. Uh, okay, please, Michelle. Michelle. Okay. Um, so the question is regarding intravitreal steroid in codes. Is it possible to make paraorbital injection of dexamo dexamethasone, for example? Um, um, it has been some cases have been treated using um, steroid um, paraorbital injection. As some cases have been described, definitely. Uh, another question is about the intravitreal protocol in codes disease. Um, the intravitreal, um, after the intravitreal injection, usually I usually prefer intravitreal anti DHEF in children and uh, in adults. It depends. Um, uh, I start with intravitreal anti DHEF, if I have a lot of exudation. I prefer steroids, and uh, after the injection, after in after uh, 15 days after the injection, I usually perform the um, the laser of the uh, anorismatical uh, changes. So another question is, uh, uh, what different approach if you see asymmetric bilateral codes? Okay. Um, mm, very um, usually, when we have bilateral codes, uh, you have very important uh, uh, features with a lot of uh, um, exudation of macular edema and uh, a lot of telangiectasia in the peripheral retina in one eye. Otherwise, in the fellow eye, usually the retinal cha vascular changes are really mild. Okay, I think that. Uh, uh, we have to move to the next presentation. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Dina Zur. Please, uh, Dina, uh, a topic is retina vein occlusion. 
Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Elisabetta, for the introduction and for the invitation. So I have the challenge to uh, talk about retinal vein occlusion in 10 minutes. So I will try to focus on the most important uh, issues. I have no financial disclosure with this presentation. As you all know, it's uh, a major concern. It's the second most common retinal vascular disorder after diabetic eye disease. And we have millions of people uh, affected in the world, whereas BRVO is about 80 to 85% of all cases, and the prevalence is rising with the age of the patients. If we talk about the um, classical classification, uh, we look at the thrombus formation site and we uh, divide between the central hemi and branch vein occlusions, whereas hemi retinal vein occlusions in the clinical studies is attributed to as the central retinal vein occlusion. We can then further divide them in according to the degree of the ischemia as the CVO and BVO studies have defined in the past. And we can also further um, look at um, subgroups such as CRV of the young or retinal vein occlusion with artery occlusion. And in the case of BRVO, we can further divide according to the severity of the um, um, uh, affected branch in major or macular VLVO. Um, the pathophysiology and histopathology is at, such as every thrombus in the body, um, and we have to remember the Wilco stride for medical school, the combination of diminished blood flow, increased blood viscosity, and endothelial disruption in an altered Blumen wall, which all together lead to the formation of the thrombus. And this is a short list of a long list of uh, risk factors that can uh, increase the risk for a CRVO case. And the most important one are hypertension and hyperlipidemia for both CRVO and BOVO cases. And there are other um, factors that increase the risk for each of them according to the textbook. Now, one major um, uh, um, point is the value or the uh, yield of a workup for hematological disorders, especially in younger patients. And this is a list of the things that you should check if you uh, are concerned about some um, state of hypercoagulability in your patient. However, if you look at the um, re recommendations of the British societies, both the Society of Hematology and also the Royal College of British Ophthalmologists, they do not recommend to do testing for thrombophilia uh, routinely, even in younger patients. But we all have the patients that we discovered that the ophthalmologist was the one to discover some state of hypercoagulability, so we have to address each case uh, separately. We should keep in mind that the risk of stroke is increased uh, around the uh, event of the RVO. Even if it's a vein occlusion, we have to uh, properly treat those patients and evaluate them for cardiovascular disease. Now, when we assess patients with RVO, of course, it's a multimodal approach. We check them clinically. We still have fluid angiography as an important tool, the OCT and the OCT angios. So we'll go quickly uh, to the major uh, points of each of them. If you have a patient with very fresh um, RVO and lots of hemorrhages, it might be uh, better to defer the FA because all those hemorrhages will obscure um, the evaluation of the retina. <clears throat> but if you prefer it, then of course we have the, the stages of, um, uh, of the RVO that you can depict there, the delayed filling time, the dilation, um, the block fluorescence due to hemorrhages, and then in the later stages, you can really see the disturbance of the inner blood retinal barrier with leakage of the dye, and um, look at the periphery in order to detect neovascularization. And this is a nice case uh, of a chronic BOVO showing you all those microvascular changes that we can see. We can quantify the ischemia. We can depict teleangiectic vessels, as you see in blue, or venous venous anastomosis, as you see in yellow. And one important entity, mainly in patients that are uh, complaining about some scotoma um, after the vein occlusion, if the, even the vein occlusion is not very bad, uh, is the paracentral acute middle maculopathy, which is a um, decreased perfusion of the middle plexus. So if you have a case of uh, CRVO, you have delayed filling of the veins. But if you take a closer look, you can see that the ciliary retinal artery 
is also not filling properly, even in the later stages. And if we do a vertical scan with OCT, you see those hyperreflective uh, thickening in the same area, which makes the diagnosis of PAM. And this is another case of a very severe ischemic RVO, where the only thing left of perfusion is uh, the ciliary retinal artery and some nasal branch. And you can see that he had a very diffuse ischemic uh, edema. And after anti-VGF treatment, all the edema resolved, but of course, the retina was very thin due to the ischemia. To show you the uh, value of white ultraviolet field imaging, this is a patient I just saw last week. She's a young uh, lady, and she actually seems to have an inflammatory etiology. But what I wanted to show you is when we um, do the white field imaging, we of course see the delayed filling. But if we, oops, sorry comes now. If we take a closer look at the periphery, you can see that even after some minutes, there's still delayed filling of the small capillaries in the periphery, as you can see here in the temporal areas. OCT, of course, is the tool that we use the most. It helps us as in every macular disease to show the cystoid retinal thinning, the subretinal fluid, sometimes only areas of reduced retinal hyperreflectivity due to some diffuse thickening, and also those hyperreflective foci or the lipids that we see clinically. Now, OCTA um, has some major advantages in the case of RBO because um, when we have um, a disturbed blood retinal barrier, you will see the leakage um, on the FA and you cannot clearly de um, detail the microvascular changes. And this is the advantage of the OCTA as you don't use the dye. Um, it has advantages in the visualization. And in some of the cases, it even might replace the FA, as you can see here. You can clearly see the white areas of non-perfusion and even a, a huge um, retinal neovascularization in the mid-periphery. You should always be concerned about uh, the event of neovascularization in ischemic RVO and the 90-day glaucoma that we might, maybe we see it less today than in the past because of the anti-VGF treatment but um, it, it's a major concern and they are very hard to treat when they develop neovascular glaucoma. So we have little, very little time to go through all of the treatments, but this is just a diagram showing you that, first of all, you need to keep in mind that we can um, um, evaluate and um, teach our, or educate the patients about control of risk factors, also to avoid um, future events of RBO on the fellow eye. And actually, we are treating mainly the complications of the RVO, which is either macular edema or neovascularization. This is just a, a summary of all the RVO studies using ranibizumab. So, so first of all, um, the pivotal trials, the Bravo and the Cruz, but then later on, many trials that try to uh, mimic real-life conditions, such as using PRN approaches, or including more ischemic cases, such as the crystal and the brighter, and lately also the RAVE trial, which looked at the value of ranibizumab in pre-proliferative CRVO. In the FLIVA set, we have the Copernicus, Galileo, and Vibrant studies. And lately, very informative, the comparative trials that showed that bevacizumab was non inferior to a FLIVA set. And the LIVO trial that compared all three agents one to another. The steroid studies are rather old, so we have the score for triamcinolone and the dexamethasone implant was shown in the Geneva trial, and there are also comparative studies for uh, dex compared to ranibizumab, um, but they were rather small as well. So some words regarding laser and RVO. Um, PRP is still the standard of care for the treatment of neovascular complications, but we have learned that in cases that have um, not yet developed neovascularization, even if there is extensive ischemia, it is uh, probably correct to uh, withhold the treatment. Or if you're concerned regarding the compliance of the patient, you can, of course, perform prophylactic laser for coagulation. A macular laser is, of course, not in the first stages of the, the treatment, but there are patients that have some microvascular changes and microvascular uh, microaneurysms uh, not central that can be easily treated with focal laser and even reduce the need for uh, anti-VGF therapy. 
So for any further uh, information, you can always go back to the uh, original RBO guidelines. They are from 2019, but still quite relevant. And some last words um, that uh, could not be uploaded in the last moment regarding uh, the treatments with, with Visimab for RBO that are still not in the original guidelines, but lately we have very, um, we have uh, data on the efficacy of uh, the Visimab for Visimab on RBO. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dina. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, do you think that uh, uh, with the advent of CT angiography, especially thinking about the wide field uh, that allow device which allow us to perform the wide field, can we substitute uh, the OCT angiography uh, to the fluorescent angiography, or do you think that we still need fluorescent angiography, especially for the very far periphery? Um, in the most most of the cases, mainly in CRVO cases, I still from fluorescent angiography at baseline. Um, but as I showed you, there are definitely cases where it can replace um, the the fluorescent angiography. It can easily show the neovascularization if it is not in the far periphery, um, and it also helps us to evaluate the degree of macular ischemia very easily. Thanks. There is a question for you, Dina. Do you usually use consultations of hematology specialists to adjust the uh, treatment or do you treat it by yourself? And the second question um, is, uh, do you use brain orbit MRI with contrast for diagnosis? Um, so regarding the hematologist uh, consultation, in younger patients, or even in not that young patients, but that do not have any cardiovascular risk factors, I do refer them to a hematologist. It also depends on the willingness of the health system to allow for testing. So sometimes I have to, to struggle with them a bit um, because it is correct that in the literature, there's no clear evidence that the, the white um, the, the routine testing has some yield, but in, in certain cases, I definitely refer them and then I let them pick um, the right test. Um, so there is another question for you from Venezuela. In some cases, the hemorrhagic edematose and ischemic uh, situation uh, under the treatment with laser, what can we do? Okay, I hope I, I get the question right. So when there are lots of hemorrhages, as I said before, in the very acute phase, it's very hard to understand how much ischemia underlying there is. And also to probably in the acute phase, there won't be any neovascularization, so I would never treat with laser. In the later phase, when you can understand um, where the ischemia is, and if there is neovascularization, usually there's not that much hemorrhage. Of course, if it's already a vitreous hemorrhage, as a complication of neovascularization, it's another story. Um, another one, and then we can move. Can we proceed directly to uh, PRP in central retina vein of case, uh, occlusion cases with glaucoma or borderline EOP? Um, so in cases of neovascular glaucoma, it's mandatory to perform, of course, the PRP properly. And if a patient has underlying glaucoma, I don't see under any interference. So there are other, other questions for, for you, but I think that we, at this moment, we have to move on to the next speaker. So thank you, Dina. So the next speaker is Professor Lisa Toto. She's talking about arterial occlusive disease. Please, Lisa. Thank you, Elisabetta, for your introduction and for uh, your kind invitation. Uh, retinal artery occlusion were firstly described in, 19, in 1859 and are considered a true emergency in ophthalmology uh, because they are associated with high cerebrovascular and cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. Uh, uh, retinal artery occlusion includes uh, different clinical entities such as central retinal artery occlusion with or without retinal sparing, branch retinal artery occlusion, serial retinal artery occlusion, carton wall spots, and paracentral acute middle macropathy. 
central retinal artery occlusion occurs from 1 to 8.5 cases per 100,000 subjects, and in more than 90% of cases, it presents over the age of 40, usually occurring in the early 60s, and is very bilateral. Branch retinal artery occlusion represents 38% of all retinal artery occlusion, typically occurring at best bifurcation and mainly affects the temporal vessels. Cedar retinal artery occlusion represents only 5% of retinal artery occlusion, and PAM uh, is associated to retinal artery occlusion, uh, ranging in a percentage from uh, 19 to 22.5%. There are several uh, uh, systemic and ocular conditions that are associated to retinal artery occlusions, but we have to keep in mind that uh, embolism is the most common cause of non-arteritic central and branch retinal artery occlusion, mainly originating from the atheromatous plaque or cardiac embolism. There are three types of uh, emboli, cholesterol emboli and in emboli that are originating from atheromatous plaque and non-refractive calcific emboli that uh, commonly originate from the valvular diseases. Uh, there are also less common types of retinal emboli, such as tumor emboli or fat emboli from fracture, septic uh, emboli, and so on. Uh, there are also other conditions, systemic conditions associated to uh, artery occlusion, such as coagulopathies, collagen vascular disease, and uh, inflammatory conditions. Um, and among these, one of the most important is uh, uh, giant cell arteritis. Also trauma is uh, associated to artery occlusion and ocular conditions such as, uh, um, for example, increasing ocular pressure. Uh, we have to do a particular mention uh, giant cell arteritis that is uh, the most frequent cause of the arteritic form of uh, retinal artery occlusion. It is an immunomediated systemic granulomatous uh, vasculitis that affects the medium and large arteries. And uh, an old mark of the giant cell arteritis is the occlusion of the posterior ciliary arteries that supply the choroid, the optic nerve head, and the cilioretinal artery. So when uh, there is a central retinal artery occlusion, it is combined to posterior ciliary artery occlusion and the involvement of posterior ciliary artery occlusion is associated also to ciliary, um, cilioretinal artery occlusion where the cilioretinal artery is present and also so, to anterior optic uh, ischemic neuropathy. And also the occlusion of posterior ciliary arteries leads to choroidal ischemic lesion. Uh, which are the features of central artery occlusion? Obviously, a sudden and severe painless monocular vision loss with visual acuity ranging from counting fingers to light perception in uh, most of patients. Uh, visual acuity is near normal if there is a transient central retinal artery occlusion or a cilioretinal artery sparing. The uh, classical cl clinical feature, as you can observe from these uh, multicolor fundus images, is the, is the retinal whitening in the posterior pole that is uh, related to ischemia of the retinal nerve fiber layer ganglion cells layers that uh, typically fades or resolve within the first weeks. And also the cherry red spot that uh, is uh, related to the absence of these layers in the central fovea and that decreases over time. In this um, image, you can observe in this case of a patent cilioretinal artery, the retinal whitening is clearly demarcated around the uh, uh, area of preserved macula that is perfused by the cilioretinal circulation. The retinal vasculature can be normal appearing or there can be attenuation both in acute and chronic phases. Obviously, you can uh, see in the embolic uh, um, origin retinal emboli in, uh, inside the, the vessels. And uh, the optic nerve head could be normal in the non arteritic form or pale if there is a, an ischemic opacification of nerve fiber layer, but uh, it is uh, um, edematous in the arteritic form and there is an association with anterior optic uh, ischemic neuropathy. The nevascularization is rare, could occur in the disc, iris, or uh, in the retina, 
but uh, uh, it's a very uh, rare uh, complication. Uh, fluorescent angiography, uh, obviously, as you can see from these angiograms, show the delayed retinal vascular flow, and there is a delay of the filling by 5 to 20 seconds, and a more remarkable delay in the retinal artery branch, and a further delay there are visible intraarterial emboli. And uh, in presence of uh, central retinal artery occlusion with the pseudo retinal artery sparing, uh, Fluorescent show perfusion of the ciliar retinal artery, as you can observe from these uh, uh, angiograms. Optical current tomography in the acute stage shows uh, increased reflectivity of the inner and middle retinal layers that is related to the non perfusion of the superficial and deep capillary plexus. And in the chronic phase, there is a thinning of the inner and middle retinal layers. If you perform OCT angiography, both in acute and chronic stage, we have a reduced vessel density, both in superficial and plexus. Um, also, branch retinal uh, artery occlusion is another um, uh, condition uh, that uh, belongs to the um, artery occlusion of the retina and is characterized by monocular vision loss, but uh, in these cases, uh, Initial visual acuity is better than 20 over 40 in most of patients, two thirds of patients. The patients can complain about visual defects related to the obstructed uh, branch artery. There is a retinal whitening at fundoscopy along the obstructed retinal artery that shows delay at FA and uh, uh, the um, ischemic hyperreflectivity at uh, uh, structural. OCT, while uh, OCTA showed, uh, shows reduced perfusion density both in superficial and deep capillary plexa in acute and chronic phase. This is a report that we published in 2018. Uh, it was the case of a 25 years old Caucasian woman complaining that he referred to our clinic complaining of migraine, confusion forgetfulness and brief episode of verbal apraxia. She also had progressive hearing loss and obviously some visual symptoms, blurred vision in her left eye and a peripheral scotoma. As you can see from this multimodal imaging, there was a branch retinal um, artery occlusion, so the ischemic whitening at fundoscopy, delayed filling at FA and use uh, um, uh, superficial capillary plexus and deep capillary plexus at OCTA. The patient uh, uh, and also MRI showing microinfarction of the corpus callosum and a audiometry hearing loss. The patient was diagnosed as having a SUSAC syndrome that is a microangiopathy, immunomediated microangiopathy that affects the endothelium of pre precapillary arterioles of the brain, retina, and the inner ear. So uh, the suicide syndrome is typically characterized by branch retinal artery occlusion. And you can see from this image the restoration of the retinal perfusion after beginning the immunosuppressive therapy. Another typical condition is paracentral acute middle maculopathy that refers to focal or diffuse band-like hyperreflective uh, uh, lesion at uh, OCT, structural OCT, that are mostly located at the inner nuclear layer, as you can observe from the um, OCT B scan, and they are, uh, are mainly located in the paracentral area. And they are due to non perfusion of the intermediate and deep retinal capillary plexus. This condition, as um, Dina uh, told us uh, before, can be associated to vascular oxygen disorders and it can uh, be associated to branch retinal artery occlusion and central retinal artery occlusion and also to central retinal vein occlusion and other systemic vascular diseases. And um, at the fundoscopy, uh, there is a subtle, deep uh, mm, evidence of whitening, or there could be a normal clinical angiographic uh, and angiographic uh, appearance. And the typical band-like hyperreflective lesion uh, at the uh, spectral domain of CT, mostly at the inner nuclear layer, and at the 
CTA, there is a reduced uh, um, perfusion of the deep capillary plexus, mainly in the late phases, but it could be also reduced in the acute phases. This is a, a nice case of uh, uh, central retinal artery occlusion with ciliar retinal artery sparing that shows paracentral acute middle uh, maculopathy in the central fovea and uh, the uh, typical hyperreflectivity of uh, inner and middle retinal layer in the lower part where there is uh, uh, the uh, uh, arterial occlusion. Another condition um, among the uh, retinal artery occlusion is the ciliar retinal artery occlusion that be present uh, as an isolated form or uh, associated with central retinal vein occlusion. And in this case, if the, CT, the ciliar retinal artery occlusion does not affect the fovea, the visual acuity correlates with the degree of the venous obstruction, and also a ciliar retinal artery occlusion that is associated with the anterior ischemic optic neuropathy that has a very um, poor visual prognosis due to the optic nerve damage. And uh, this can be seen in giant cell arthritis. And uh, the, the, at the fundoscopy, we can observe the edematous optic disc and the retinal warning along the course of the ciliar retinal artery. And uh, it is typical of these cases that uh, F shows no filling of the choroid due to the occlusion of the posterior ciliar arteries that uh, supply the choroid. Uh, another condition is the cotton wool spots that are uh, white inner retinal ischemic uh, lesion that are mainly to the posterior segment of the fundus, they develop secondary to the obstruction of a retinal arteriole, so uh, with resultant ischemia and non-perfusion of the superficial vascular plexus. At multimodal uh, imaging, so at the fundoscopy, they appear as white lesion, as non-perfusion, capillary non-perfusion at uh, FA, and and the inner layer edema with hyperflectivity at structural OCT. Also, cotton wool spots have different uh, etiologies. Diabetes and sy systemic hypertension are the most common, but also embolism is another cause. In uh, retinal uh, artery occlusion, it is important the vascular workup is mandatory. Uh, first of all, to exclude arteritic cause, so erythrocyte sedimentation rate, C reactive protein, and platelet count have to be assessed in the suspect of uh, an arteritic cause. But uh, in non arteritic uh, form, we have to check for com common vascular risk factors, so blood pressure, fasting cholesterol, blood sugar levels, and also uh, in the suspect of colic, we have to investigate and perform carotid ultrasound and the echocardiogram. Whilst in young patient, the age lower than 50 and no vascular risk factor, we have to do an hypercoagulable screen, vasculitic screen, and also assess the possible presence of myeloproliferative or sickle cell disease. As far as regards the treatment uh, in the uh, non-arteritic central retinal artery occlusion, there is no evidence-based uh, therapy, but the treatment recommended uh, um, is the done within four hours uh, uh, from the uh, onset of symptoms. And the current potential therapy consists of dislodging the embolia, increasing retinal blood flow, uh, both by ocular mass uh, or by intraocular pressure reduction reduction or retinal vascular vasodilation or uh, some surgical approach uh, have been reported in the literature such as neomedial glass and arteriotomy or intraarterial thrombolytic therapy even though this last one has not shown a different visual acuity um, compared to conservative treatment. Uh, anticoagulants should be reserved in a case of underlying systemic diseases such as atrial fibrillation of uh, internal or internal carotid artery dissection, hypercoagulable state. And in the arteritic form, uh, we have to use corticosteroid intravenous uh, in the acute phase and then with oral uh, administration in the maintaining dose. 
for the uh, paracentral acute middle maculopathy, no definitive treatment exists, but there are reports in the literature of uh, use of vasodilators such as nitroglycerin or hyperbaric uh, oxygen therapy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Lisa, for this uh, great presentation. There is uh, a question to you. Um, the one is, uh, do you refer PAM patients to apoplexy department? Uh, no. Um, I uh, perform anyway all the uh, important assessments such as echocardiography and uh, um, carotid ultrasound uh, because uh, PAM is, uh, if there is only PAM, it uh, is a sign of a potential development uh, of more ischemic uh, disease and uh, uh, of possible uh, cerebrovascular accidents, but I do not refer them uh, immediately for uh, assessment of uh, possible cerebrovascular accidents, but I um, perform all the exams that to be done. In, uh, in the search of possible uh, embolism or other causes uh, from, uh, um, from uh, atheromatous plaque or from uh, uh, cardiac disease, valvular disease. Okay, and uh, another question is, I think that more or less it would be the same um, answer. Would you normally examine the radial pulse and auscultate these patients with artery occlusion in your clinic? Would you? In your clinic, we you normally examine their radial pulse and auscultate these patients with artery occlusion in your clinic, or you, do you usually refer to a different clinician? No, I refer to a different clinician. I don't do general uh, assessment or systemic assessment. Okay. And another question, you, do you administrate antiglaucomatos after uh, an episode of uh, retinal artery occlusion? I usually use uh, uh, manitol, intravenous uh, manitol, and uh, topical uh, uh, antiglaucoma drops. So uh, to um, uh, increase the perfusion, the, and to try to dislodge the, the, the embolus, if there is an embolus, I usually perform intravenous manitol or intravenous acetatolamide. Okay. And do you usually perform fluorescein angiography or you don't? I usually perform fluorescein angiography uh, when uh, it occurs. So um, in all patients with the artery occlusion, I perform fluorescein angiography, even though uh, the, the clinical uh, picture could be clear in most cases. And also if we have a PAM, it is uh, enough to perform an, uh, a, structural, a structural CT and uh, to, to make a diagnosis. But I, I prefer to perform in all of patients uh, the fluorescent angiography. Uh, maybe uh, also in the follow-up it should be done, even though neovascularization uh, occurs in a very, very low uh, percentage of cases. So it is not the, the main complication in this case. Um, and this is due to anoxia and non uh, to hypoxia, so the VEGF production is not so uh, important. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Dina answered some questions directly to the um, uh, to some attendees. Did you? Yes, I, I did. I could I comment on the um, on the stroke assessment? Sure, please. So we have lately implemented in our center um, a stroke protocol for patients that come in with central retinal artery occlusion. So it starts like a triage right at the moment when the patient enters the ER. If they have uh, unilateral uh, vision loss in the last uh, couple of hours, 
And then they are seen immediately by the ophthalmologist. And if it's a central retinal artery occlusion, they are directly defer, referred to the neurologist and they do a CT scan in the ER. And then we offer them TPA, intravenous TPA treatment. Oh. The problem is that the minority of patients arrive in the time frame that we can offer it. But if we give it quickly, we do see improvement uh, in functional outcomes. Yeah. Right. I think that you have uh, yeah. hemorrhages complication uh, using uh, intravenous. No. Uh, no. 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 Mm -hmm. Great. Right. I think that the multidisciplinary approach is great in these specific cases. So I think it's done. So thank you all, the speakers, for um, these great presentations. And uh, thanks to all the attendees that uh, uh, attended this webinar. Uh, have a good night and enjoy the evening. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you, Elisabetta. Thank you.